Everything in the universe has its size. Planets are big. Insects are small. People are somewhere in between. Everything has its place in the grand order. Things are as they should be. But does it have to be that way? Does size really matter, or could things be different? After all, short people live longer than tall people. Small things are stronger than big things. And really tiny creatures can do things we can only dream of. So why are things the size they are? And what if we could change that? Using the latest science, we are going to do the ultimate thought experiment. We are going to shrink everything in our world, including us, to see whether a smaller world really is more beautiful. Along the way, we're going to discover just how much size matters, how it defines everything. You'll never look at yourself or your world the same way again. You might think this looks like an ordinary house on an ordinary sunny morning. If you watched the last programme, then you'll know that this is a parallel universe. One just like our own, but with one important difference. In this universe, we can change the size of things, just to see what happens. We are going to change the size of stars, planets and living things, and see the surprising effects it has on a normal guy going about his normal day. We'll find out if the way things are is the only way they can be, or if size is just an accident. In our last Grand Thought experiment, we made everything big. But it all went wrong. Badly wrong. So now we're going to go the other way, to see if small really could be beautiful. Where do we start? Since this is a thought experiment, we can start anywhere we like. So how about here? Home. Our planet. Earth is the fifth largest planet in the solar system. Or the fourth smallest. Maybe we could move it down the scale towards Venus, Mars, or Mercury. This is the Earth you're used to. 12,756 kilometers across, with a circumference of 40,000 kilometers, which takes an airliner about two days to fly around. There's an atmosphere 100 kilometers deep all the way around, then a thin layer of solid rock, 5,000 kilometers of rock and molten metal, and finally, a 2,600-kilometre ball of solid iron at the core. But these are just numbers. The question is, do they matter? Is it important that our world is exactly the size it is now? Surely it's simple enough to imagine our Earth, but, say, half the size across. All made of the same stuff, same proportions, just a bit smaller. Problem is, changing Earth's size changes things you don't want to be changing. And one of those is gravity. Gravity, basically a very, very important force in the universe. Whenever you have an object, it will attract everything that you have around you. So this works for planets, but it also works for everything uh, in the universe. To, uh, for instance, galaxies or, or stars. Everything attracts everything. A half-sized planet means half the normal gravity at the surface. Enough of a change to put a spring in your step. And if you're athletic, who knows what you would be capable of? Half gravity means you can jump higher. and fall slower. 
So far, so good. But then, the fun would stop. The universe is, is a system, basically. So size is important in the sense that if you change the size of one single element with respect to the others, then the whole thing breaks. For starters, half gravity means air pressure is half what it was, as the planet pulls the atmosphere less strongly towards it. Pressure at sea level is now the same as it used to be 5,500 metres up a mountain. There is less oxygen in every breath. Within a few hours, humanity would have oxygen deficiency, otherwise known as altitude sickness. Humans can adapt to thinner air. After a few days, red blood cell counts would begin to increase to compensate for the reduced oxygen. Just in time to notice the next strange change. The aurora is an amazing display of light, sometimes visible near the North and South Poles. But why does the aurora exist? And what has made it turn up far from where it's supposed to be? It's a puzzle. And to solve it, we need to look not to outer space, but to the University of Maryland. Daniel Lathrop has spent 20 years building models of the inside of planet Earth to help him understand just how our planet generates a magnetic field, work that is vital for understanding the aurora. Dan's model has a solid metal ball at its center, surrounded by a thick layer of molten metal, just like planet Earth. As the Earth rotates, the currents of molten metal generate a magnetic field. Dan built his model to study how this happens. You may wonder why he bothered. The fact is, the Earth's magnetic field is very important indeed. So the Earth's magnetic field serves as a shield against the worst parts of bad uh, solar weather. So the sun has storms that occasionally give large amounts of radiation aimed at the Earth. And the Earth's magnetic field inflates something like a bubble around the Earth, the magnetosphere, that acts as a primary barrier to the worst of the radiation. It's this solar radiation that causes the aurora. The shape of the planet's protective magnetic field tunnels the sun's radiation towards the poles, where it hits the upper atmosphere. This makes the gases glow, giving us a beautiful light show. But Dan's machine can also help us find out why a smaller Earth has auroras in unexpected places. Because over the years, he's built several smaller versions of his model Earth. So these actually are the first three sodium experiments we built to try to understand the Earth's magnetic field. So the, the first one, 20 centimeter diameter model, rapidly rotating. Next came 30 centimeter experiment. There's an inner sphere deep inside there that you can't see. And the third experiment at 60 centimeters, here's the bottom half of the outer sphere, and then a, a solid copper model of the inner core that independently rotates. And then the whole thing would be filled with liquid sodium in the experiments. Thinking about uh, what it would be like if the Earth were half size, we could then examine data between the different size experiments to see how the magnetic fields are different. Dan's model is filled with the metal sodium because of its low melting point. But it still takes three days before it's fully melted and ready to spin. So here we see magnetic field data from the 30 centimeter smaller experiment. And comparing it then to more recent data from three meter, it's very evident that as the, our experiments have gotten larger, we have much more magnetic induction, much stronger magnetic fields overall. So smaller Earth would have a weaker magnetosphere. But that's not all the experiments reveal. When we go from larger to a smaller experiment, the magnetic field strengths have both uh, become weaker and have changed pattern. If you look at uh, you know the data in the larger model, you know, there's a kind of well-defined north-south magnetic poles. Where in the smaller experiment, at these parameters, we had like a ring 
of south poles around the equator and then two magnetic norths at either end. So it is possible for the shape of the magnetic fields to change when you change its size. A smaller Earth would be likely to have many magnetic poles spread around its surface, meaning auroras could show up where you least expect them. And they'd be stronger than ever. But that's a bad thing, a very bad thing. It's a sign that our magnetic field is being overwhelmed. If you have um, a smaller planet with a weaker magnetic field, there will be more problems with telecommunications. The sun still has these big um, uh, anger things, they are called coronal mass ejections, where it really sends a burst of radiation in space. We have systems on Earth which are, which are so big, depending on electricity, that when the sun is angry, potentially you have big outages and it causes problems. The sun's outbursts would cause a weaker magnetic field to wobble violently, inducing surges in electrical systems. The result is havoc to power supplies, communications, and in fact, just about all electronics. Then, things go from bad to worse. If we had no magnetic field around the Earth at all, then we would be directly hit by the radiation from the sun, and the Earth would become a very, very toxic environment. Without the protective effect of a strong magnetic field, Earth is in real trouble. Lower gravity means gases can escape into space. Cosmic radiation supercharges the process. Eventually, there would be no air left to breathe. Its precious atmosphere stripped and blasted away. the Earth would end up like Mars. It's the curse of small planets. Small planets are not really up to supporting human life. So it's time to put things back to how they were. A planet 12,756 kilometers across, with an atmosphere 100 kilometers deep all the way around, and a circumference of 40,000 kilometers. Planet Earth, just as it should be. Not too big, not too small. So far, so not so good. In pursuit of a smaller, more beautiful world, we turned it into an uninhabitable desert. Maybe it's time to try something a little less risky. Like human beings. So how big are people, anyway? There are about 4,000 uh, mammal species in the world, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. The largest, of course, are the whales. The blue whale is absolutely enormous, um, the size of several school buses put together. And the smallest mammal is, is very small, two grams. It's essentially the size of your thumb. And the typical size of a mammal, however, um, is not sort of in the middle. Instead, it's much closer to the smallest size, uh, about 40 grams, which is the size of a rat. Humans are about uh, 65 kilos uh, on average, give or take. Um, and so uh, that makes us uh, enormous. When we look at an elephant, we may feel small, but in fact, human beings are around 1,600 times heavier than the average mammal. But that's not necessarily good news. Aaron Closet is a data scientist who studies the relationship between size and extinction. What we found is that the larger an animal is, the more likely that species is to go extinct in the long run. And there are various reasons for this. Um, typically, Species that are larger have smaller populations, and so if there happen to be a few bad years in terms of reproduction or food, then their population can crash, and as a result, they can become extinct. Whereas much smaller animals uh, typically have much larger populations, and so they are robust to these kinds of, of, uh, of events. In the extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs, 
every land creature that weighed over 25 kilograms died, which is why the only dinosaurs we have today are the birds. So in general, the larger the animal is, the faster it goes extinct. Bye -bye. For living things, size is a matter of life or death. But human size is not fixed. It has changed a lot over the course of history. Back in the Stone Age, when humans lived as hunter-gatherers, the average male height was similar to now. During the Neolithic Revolution, when we started farming, we shrunk hugely as our new grain-based diet had a lower nutritional value. Humans stayed short for several thousand years. It's only in the last 200 years that we finally got back to hunter-gatherer size and beyond, thanks to modern improvements in food and medicine. But paradoxically, getting taller isn't always a good thing. Although big animals have longer lifespans than smaller ones, within each species, the story is different. It's been observed that in many species, it's the shorter individuals that actually live longer, like in dogs. Could the same also be true for humans? I guess, you know, in a lot of species, and if you look at dogs, horses, elephants, it's actually the smaller variants of that species that seem to live longer. And of course, then the real question is, does it also apply to humans? But that's not so easy to answer. There are so many influences on our lives. How can you tell what's due to size and what's due to, say, diet or exercise? Geneticist Diana van Heemst has been re-examining a remarkable 1970s study that found a solution. It honed in on a group of people with very similar lifestyles but varying heights. Professional athletes. For example, American baseball players, there's a nice uh, encyclopedia, which is actually a rich source of information, not only uh, for the baseball fans about, you know, all the details about the performances and nicknames, but also actually it contains date of birth, date of death, their, their adult height and, uh, and their weight. The study took this information on height and age of death and looked for a pattern. Wally Burnett, 1 meter 83. Murray Dixon, 1 meter 78. The original study used data from thousands of players, but we can see what they discovered by looking at just a few. I took from the uh, Encyclopedia of Baseball nine representative examples of baseball players, and we have, you know, um, attached them to the wall based on the height and the age at that, and this kindly mimics the original study, which made huge of the full sample of the encyclopedia, which found this negative correlation between height and the age at death. The 1970s study found that size did matter. Being five centimeters shorter meant, on average, you would live two years longer. The big question is why. Although the original work was conducted in the 1970s, it's only now researchers like Diana have come up with a possible explanation. In order to grow, our body makes growth hormone, which, you know, stimulates growth. But at the same time, it also influences lots of other processes in our body. And if we look at the data that have been uh, derived from work on other animals, we can see that um, those growth hormones, they stimulate the body to grow. And this is kind of a signal that there's enough food, that you know there's favorable conditions, that it would be wise to invest as much as possible energy in growth and reproduction. And this may come at a cost, because it means there's less energy available to invest simply in maintaining our bodies in good shape. And actually, when conditions get adverse or become less favorable, like when there is a food shortage, or lots of toxins, then uh, as a consequence, as a response to that, we don't grow, we kind of stop growth, and we really invest the available energy in maintaining our body and trying to kind of, you know, survive this period of hardship until things get better. It seems being big comes at a price. But for tall people, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. 
However, size is not the only thing that matters. There's lots of things that people can do themselves to adopt a healthy lifestyle, like, you know, not smoking, healthy food, lots of exercise. So it matters, but it's not the only thing that matters. So just how small can we go? Well, let's start with what we know. The smallest adult humans known to science are just over 50 centimeters tall. Like Jyoti Amge, the world's smallest woman. Twenty-four-year-old student Jyoti is on a sightseeing trip to London. Wherever she goes, she gets as much attention as the biggest attractions. When I go outside, then everyone gathers together and stares at me. Then I feel a bit strange. But at the same time, it feels good that they all look at me. In our last episode, we met Sultan Kosen, the world's tallest man. Sultan is so tall because his body produces too much growth hormone. For Jyoti, the opposite is true. While Sultan has various health issues caused by being tall, for Jyoti, the story is different. The doctors told me I have hormone deficiency. This is the reason I can't grow taller. I don't have any other health problems. Jyoti's main complaint is simple. The world is just too big for her. One thing which I can't do because of my height is drive cars. And when I want to go out, I can't go out alone. I always have to have help from my family. Like my sisters and brothers, I always need help. These are the problems I face. But in a specially adapted environment, it's a different story. In my house, everything is specially made for me. In my bedroom, I have a small bed, cupboard, chair, table, and everything made in my size, all my furniture. I don't have any problems in my house. So what if we were all the size of Jyoti? We could adapt our environment to suit our smaller size. We would need less food and energy, which has to be a good thing. But surely we can go further than this. Could a mammal this small survive? The answer is yes. In the wild, Etruscan shrews weigh just two grams, which makes them one of the smallest mammals in the world. So it's a good role model for a miniature human being. Each one has a heart, lungs, and all the organs you would expect. But the similarities with human beings stop there. This tiny mammal lives its life right at the edge of what is possible. Professor Michael Brecht has studied them for years. Ah, uh, here they are, cool. And I'm gonna chase them into this. So now here we have him. Let me show you what we do for gender determination. So the sexes, they look quite similar. The really um, foolproof uh, sex testing is what I'm gonna do now. So we actually uh, use this box here. And what you do is uh, you carefully, uh, you put the shrew into the little box and you carefully sniff on it. Now, if it's very, very stinky, it turns out it's a female. If you sniff on it and you pass out, it's a male. So let me do this here. Female. Okay, now let's figure out how much he weighs. Uh, this is on the higher side uh, for these animals. Many of the adults are just two grams. They're 
have perfectly the same uh, uh, mammalian equipment. It's all there. It's just very tiny. Like, uh, it's very difficult to circulate blood through such a small body. The circulation system of mammals, it's much uh, more suitable for bigger bodies. Uh, and both the respiration and the blood supply are a huge challenge for such a small body. So what we would see is they have a, a, a giant heart, yeah, of 5% of the body weight or so, uh, a really big heart. Uh, what uh, we also see is that they have uh, unheard of respiration rates. So like when they're very excited, very nervous, one would see uh, breaths per minute go up to about a thousand breaths per minute, uh, absolutely unheard of uh, rate in mammals really also difficult to understand how a mammalian uh, brain and, and lung could do that. Almost a thousand breaths a minute is certainly fast, but their hearts push things even further, beating up to 1,500 times a minute. That's 20 beats for every beat of a human heart. It's clearly hard work for a mammal to be so small. The question is, why bother? The idea that ecologists have about these animals is that they are specialists for small spaces, yeah? For tunnels and uh, that they go into small spaces where no other predator can go and where they then paradoxically are again big predators. Matching your size to your environment is an important part of evolution. But filling this niche comes at an incredible cost. The biggest problem they face is heat loss. We see him in a, a thermal camera, and you see how much uh, heat uh, he, he gives off, how much he lights up. And uh, this is actually a central problem of their life. Uh, the, the immense uh, heat loss uh, they have, or energy loss they have, as a result of their unfavorable surface to volume ratio. For every gram of body mass, small creatures like the shrew have more skin than bigger creatures like us. A human has a quarter of a square centimetre of skin for every gram. But a shrew has much more, almost 20 times more, in fact. So a shrew loses heat much more easily, which is particularly bad news for a mammal. Unlike insects and reptiles, mammals have to keep their bodies at a temperature of around 37 degrees centigrade to survive. Only one mammal has the heat loss problem worse than Etruscan shrews, their babies. But somehow, with the help of their parents, they survive. The newborn shoes are incredibly small, inconceivably small. 0.2 grams is just absolutely incredible. And they look kind of unreal. I mean, the whole body is totally transparent. They huddle together very heavily. Uh, the mother is uh, very protective and obviously also supplies a lot of uh, uh, energy. If mammals can get this small, then why not a human? It's feasible that the human body could work at just five centimetres tall. But of course, we'd face all the same problems as the shrew. An insane heart rate and a constant battle to keep warm. Life at this size requires a totally different lifestyle. It's not just about huddling together for warmth. If you're losing energy fast, you need to be very good at replacing it. In fact, scientists have discovered that small animals have to have a completely different relationship to food than big animals. More than 100 years ago, a scientist named Kleiber observed uh, empirically that the amount of food that an animal requires uh, increases, of course, with how big the animal is. So an elephant eats more than uh, a deer does. Uh, but that the relationship doesn't go up proportionally. So an elephant eats a little bit less than you'd expect uh, than an equal number of deers uh, would. An Asian elephant weighs about 5,000 kilograms. But how much does it eat? Just ask a zookeeper. This is the amount of hay one of our male elephants gets every day, 43 kilos to 45 kilos which is about 1% of its body weight. For the dick dick, um, their mass is about seven kilos. This is the amount of alfalfa our dick dick get on a daily basis, 0.5 kilos. 
around 7% of its body mass. Repeat this for all kinds of different animals and a clear pattern emerges. The smaller the animal, the more food energy they need per kilo of body mass. And for the smallest animals, the amount of food they need goes through the roof. Applying to our five centimeter human, Kleiber's law reveals we'd have to eat our own body weight every day. Most of our life would be spent looking for food, just like the Etruscan shrew. But what if we went smaller still? So if you were to take a, a mammal um, and to make it smaller than the smallest current mammal, then it would cease to be a mammal as we know it, because the, uh, the rate at which it would lose heat in the environment would be so great, it couldn't maintain its, its internal temperature um, to be warm-blooded. And so it would have to change its physiology. It would have to become cold-blooded and use different strategies in order to regulate its temperature. So going smaller means saying goodbye to being a mammal. From here on, we'll need to be cold-blooded, with organs more like an insect. But it's worth it, because incredible things start happening once you get down to the size of a wasp. At Cambridge University, they are finding that for very small creatures, the world is a completely different place to the one we experience. It's as if they're ruled by separate laws of physics. In terms of their relative strength, you might almost say that insects are superheroes. So some of the strongest ants can easily carry four or five times their own body weight, which for us is the equivalent of almost a small car if you're a relatively big human. This is all because volume, area and length change by different amounts when you make things smaller. The overall effect is to make small creatures relatively much stronger than big ones. Professor David Labonte carries out tests on ants to see just how strong. Ants supports the weight of a paintbrush, which is roughly 2.5 grams. That corresponds to around 500 times its own weight, which would be the equivalent of me for 40 tons, which is probably about six, seven lorries. So that's really quite impressive. But there's more to being small than just strength. As we know, small creatures have bigger surface area for their weight. A fact that can be a lifesaver. So one of the very first studies that thought about the question how size matters and what the right size for an animal is, thought about a problem of why you can drop an ant down a shaft and the ant just falls down the ground and walks away. But if you would do the same to a human, the human would break. Because the ant is so small, air resistance is much more important for the ant. So the velocity with which the ant hits the ground is much uh, slower than what would happen to a human. Taken to an extreme, it's why rock dust floats in the air, but rocks don't, even though they're made of the same stuff. And there are even more advantages to being so small. So one of the things we're interested in is how well insects stick. And one of the techniques we use to measure that is a centrifuge. So we take a little ant, put it on a centrifuge, and start spinning it around. And we then try and measure at what acceleration these ants actually fall off the centrifuge. Wow. G-force is the name for the feeling you might get on a steep roller coaster. In the tightest turn, you might experience 6G. But even with much, much higher G-forces, Somehow, the ants hang on. And during these measurements, we've seen ants withstand 500G, 1000G for 10, 20, even 30 seconds, and then they fall off and walk off as if nothing happens. It's this same ability to hang on that allows insects to walk up the smoothest of walls, even hang on to the ceiling. So how does it work? Insects or geckos or any animal that climbs with adhesive feet, they don't, can't use a glue because it will take a long time to activate and deactivate. So as far as we know, climbing animals use intermolecular forces to stick to surfaces. It's still under debate what exactly these intermolecular forces are. If you have two molecules and they attract each other, then you have to convince them to split apart, and that's what helps, the, helps these animals to stick. We experience these intermolecular sticking forces too, but at our normal human size, 
we're not even aware of them because they are tiny compared to gravity. But once more, being small changes the rules. A five millimeter human could climb a wall just like an ant. But it's not all good news for small creatures. A five millimeter human may be good at climbing, but he might not understand why he's doing it. It's a problem that affects all very small creatures. Brain size. Our brains rely on our neurons, and it looks like that neurons remain relatively constant in size across different animals. So whether you're a very small animal or a very big animal, the neuron is approximately the same size. Now this immediately means that if you're very small, you have fewer neurons, and that might present you with a problem regarding your cognitive abilities. The bottom line is, if you're going to get really small, you're going to lose brain power. A five millimeter human would only have around two million neurons, which puts him somewhere between a cockroach and a small fish. Smart enough to spot food, but probably not smart enough to worry about the puddle of coffee in the way. For normal-sized people, surface tension is barely noticeable. But when you're tiny, it's suddenly deadly. Surface tension is a force that becomes very, very powerful if you're very small, and really unimportant if you're really big. So for very small animals, a droplet of water can be very dangerous, while very large animals will hardly notice the droplets. Superpowers or not, being small has too many downsides, like tiny brains constantly looking for food, and of course, if you're that small, almost everything in the world wants to eat you. So it's for the best that we return things to how they were. Because the size we are now is a perfect fit for the way we live and the world we live in today. Lifespan, health, food, society, resources, it all goes hand in hand with our size. We've tried shrinking the planet, and even ourselves, but so far, small has not proved to be beautiful. But there's one thing we haven't tried, something so big that surely we could make it a little smaller without ending life as we know it. The sun. Perhaps a smaller sun would be a good idea. Less skin cancer, a cooler climate, the sun we have is a kind of star known to astronomers as a G2 dwarf. But it's not really much of a dwarf by human standards. In fact, it's 1.4 million kilometers wide. That's 109 times wider than the Earth. But does it have to be so preposterously large? Or would everything work out fine with a smaller, gentler sun that won't damage our skin and we can look at without sunglasses? The key to this question is understanding what makes a star shine. Stars are big balls of gas which have been pulled together by gravity. At some point, the gases literally fuse. Subatomic hydrogen particles get squashed together to make helium. This is nuclear fusion, which generates such enormous amounts of energy that we've been trying to replicate the process on Earth ever since it was discovered. The problem is, but it turns out it's incredibly hard to do. This is one of the world's best attempts, JET, Joint European Taurus, based at Cullum in the UK. The first place on Earth that they managed to achieve controlled nuclear fusion. A phenomenally complicated and expensive facility where they use as much power as a small town to superheat the gases until they fuse. Jet physicist Ivor Coffey knows just how intense things get. The fusion takes place inside this chamber. We actually create a highly ionized gas or plasma. Sort of the center of the plasma, which is probably roughly just above my head, would be where the sort of this, where the temperature and density at the, at the maximum temperature there could be something in the region of between 100 and 150 million degrees centigrade. Conditions in here are so extreme that they can only run the machine for 30 seconds at a time. Today, they're running the fusion test at even higher power levels than they've tried before. What you are 
you're looking at right now is actual fusion. This is the very same process that happens at the heart of a star. The problem of making fusion happen on Earth is no different to the problem of making it happen in space. But stars manage to solve this problem by being incredibly big. The main requirement, if you want to trigger fusion anywhere in the universe, inside of stars or in a laboratory on Earth, is that you have to create conditions of very high temperature. And uh, the problem then is that if you have high temperature, you uh, also basically have the problem that this high temperature ball of material uh, wants to be pushed out by the pressure. So you have to somehow overcome the pressure. And the stars do this by having all the gravity of the overlying material. The gravity of the star is uh, confining the pressure of the hot material. For stars, size matters. If they're not big enough, fusion can't happen. And without fusion, it's not a star at all. If we make stars smaller, less massive, um, the temperature of the, uh, of the star in the center will also go down. And at some point, uh, the temperature is not sufficient any longer to uh, ignite nuclear fusion. And uh, this really is the fundamental limit, if you like, for stardom. The very smallest we could make our sun, or indeed any star, is around 10 times the width of the Earth. But with a sun this size, what kind of Earth would we wake up to? For starters, you'd be seeing red. The reason that this low mass star uh, would be red is that this star would have a much reduced gravity, and therefore also it would have uh, uh, a much reduced temperature. You would shift um, the uh, the peak uh, wavelength of your photons that the star is emitting uh, to longer and longer wavelengths. This means that we shifted from the yellow that our sun has into the red that those red dwarf stars would have. A star this size would be no brighter than the moon. But light isn't the only casualty. Within hours, we'd feel a bigger problem. What would happen to a planet around such a red dwarf central star. The most dramatic thing is that because of the uh, very, very much uh, reduced temperature, we would basically experience a deep freeze. Temperatures would plummet. A star this size gives off just one six thousandth of the heat of our sun. All the liquid water would be converted into ice. Even our atmosphere would begin to freeze out we would uh, enter into a state of uh, complete cold, deep, uh, desperate uh, freeze. As the Earth cools further, all the gases in the air solidify, causing the atmosphere to collapse. So how do we save the world? The answer may seem obvious. We move the planet closer to the sun so that things warm up. But would that actually work? Earth's normal orbit is about 150 million kilometers from the Sun. This is the middle of the habitable zone, the region of the solar system where it's not too hot and not too cold. Now we've moved the Earth nearly 100 times closer to the tiny Sun. At this distance, our planet gets the same energy from the Sun as we're used to but this is a different world. The sun may be tiny, but we are so close that it would look big in the sky, around 10 times bigger than we're used to. But there are problems to face, problems that the best scientists in the world are trying to solve, because they've recently discovered a planet just like this, and it turns out it's our nearest neighbor. If you look at the many stars in the night sky, you probably won't even notice Proxima Centauri. It's actually the closest of them all, but it's very small, just one-seventh the size of the sun. But it's up there. And at Queen Mary University London, astronomers have been looking very hard at the faint light it gives off to see what they can discover about the sun's tiny neighbor. Proxima Centauri is the nearest star to the Sun. 
This is where astronomy begins. So it's really the first spot in the, the next frontier. So the first place to go when we go beyond our solar system. So that makes it very special. In August 2016, they made an astonishing discovery by analyzing the light that Proxima Centauri gives off. So basically what we do, we go to the telescope. The telescope um, has an optical fiber sitting at the focus. And then the light from the star goes through the optical fiber to the basement of the observatory, where there's a spectrometer. And what the spectrometer does, takes the light coming from the optical fiber. And these two elements here, a prism and a grating, separate the light into wavelengths. And we see that there are these dark spots in the middle of the traces. These are the footprints of um, molecules and atoms of the atmosphere of the star. When they observed the star again, they saw that the spectrum of Proxima Centauri was changing. So we come here to the telescope two months later. Um, we take more data, and then we see that the, the measurements start to, to trend. Something is happening, but we don't know what. We get more measurements, more measurements, more measurements, and after two years, then we see that the, it reaches a peak, and then you have this signal. And it's repeating also. If we could keep observing the star, we see the same thing over and over again. These wobbles in the spectrum reveal that the star is being pulled backwards and forwards. It's the telltale sign of a planet orbiting close by. Further study shows that this planet, called Proxima b, has a lot of similarities to our own. It's roughly Earth-sized and mostly made of rock. But unlike Earth, which takes 365 days to go around its sun, the spectrum patterns reveal that Proxima b takes a mere 11 days meaning it must be very close to its star. When the scientists did the maths, they realized it is at a perfect distance for the possibility of life. Not too hot and not too cold. There are many more factors to consider before they know if life is possible. It's so nearby to the solar system that we can expect to actually um, start to search for evidence of life in, in planets like is one in Proxima Centauri and also some very nearby stars. As the search for life on Proxima b begins, what can we learn from it to help our thought experiment? Could life survive this close to a small sun? For a start, plants would have to be a different color. Plants are green because of the specific wavelength of light they use. But if our sun was red, like Proxima Centauri, crucial wavelengths would be missing and green plants wouldn't work. They'd have to be black to absorb as much sunlight as possible. Our planet would look very different, but there's a much bigger problem, a possible side effect of being so close to a star, tidal locking. So basically you have a small star. The small star makes very little energy. It's, it's also faint. So you need to be warm, you need to be close to it. And the fact of being close to it means that you suffer very strong tidal forces then. And the most likely what will happen is like what happens with the moon to the, to the Earth. The rotation of the planet is synchronized to the orbit of the planet. So the same side faces the star. With one side frozen in perpetual night and the other in never-ending sun, planets that are fully tidally locked are sometimes called eyeball planets. The world we are used to isn't possible around a smaller sun. Even if we move close enough to the sun to be warm, Earth would be a very difficult place to live. It turns out that the size of our sun is everything. Any smaller and we can't have a green world, can't have night and day, and most of our world becomes deadly. It seems we are better off with the sun the size it was, us the size we are, living on a planet that is just right. Size does matter. Size uh, determines on the one hand, you know, the height we will achieve, but on the other hand, size determines our lifespan because size determines how much energy we invest in maintaining our body in good shape. A very large animal and a very small animal live in completely different worlds. So they face completely different problems 
evolution has produced completely different solutions to these problems. And for scientists, it's really interesting to try and understand how things work at small scales and big scales. How big you are determines the scale of the world around you and how you interact with it. The smaller you become, uh, the kinds of things that are dangerous to you change. But size is also a very mutable variable. It's flexible, and mammals have found a way to live very successfully at all different sizes. I think size is important in the universe. It's a clockwork, really. You have your clock, and everything works perfectly. But if you change the size of one of the cogs, then it doesn't fit with the rest anymore, and the whole system will collapse. Size isn't like a color or clothing. It's not arbitrary. It goes hand in hand with so many things. Gravity, intelligence, the evolution of life itself. Our size is who we are and what we always will be.